So before going to the, to the um, detail of my presentation, I would like just to give a kind of overall um, uh, view of my research. So I work in computer vision with, let's say, three main topics. The first one is, uh, is perception, like let's say a standard perception task, like, like uh, depth estimation or estimating uh, the pose of a person in Im an image. But then I started to work on uh, other tasks like generation, where the goal is to train deep neural networks, not to classify or to analyze images or videos, but to regenerate images and videos. And recently I started to work on uh, adaptation on domain adaptation. So domain adaptation is a problem that consists in uh, adapting a neural network that has been trained on a source data set in order to work in an environment that is slightly different. And I have words that are at the interse intersections between these three areas. But today I'm going to speak mostly about the generation part here in green. Uh, so first, why do we need to generate images and videos? There are many reasons. I would like to, to cite a few to give you an overall uh, understanding of what are the possible applications. The first one is obviously uh, photo editing. So for example, if you have an image of a, a sad person and you would like to edit this, uh, this image to make, it, uh, to make him smiling, um, you could do it manually with a tool like Photoshop, but it requires first to be an expert to know the tool to do it manually, and it takes a lot of time. So it, this is something that you can do on a few images, but not on millions of images. And also it takes a lot of time, but with Neuronet, we want to be able to do it just in a couple of milliseconds. Another application is uh, is to transfer style. So you have an input image, you want to take the style of painting and you want to transfer this style to get a, a painting like this Van Gogh, but still preserving the, um, the content of the input image. It has also application in augmented reality. For example, if you want to, to have a virtual store or um, it would be convenient to oh, I hear some noise. Okay, it would be convenient to have a tool where you could uh, virtually uh, try on some cloud this like this uh, company to Galax that is uh, selling that kind of solutions. But there are many other applications like video games. Uh, for example, if you want to have like a really photorealistic environment for having a more realistic games, we can use a kind of, of a, a neural network based techniques. And also, for example, if you want to increase some interesting uh, image properties, so for example, if you, you work on um, communication, if you want to increase the impact of your image, you want that people that see the image will remember this image, so you can augment by editing the picture that kind of properties. Uh, but there are also, let's say, more scientific reason to be interested in this problem of uh, image and video generation. Uh, the first one is that if you want to train a neural net for a, let's say recognition task, like here, head pose estimation, uh, it can be really costly to get ground truth data. And in some cases, it's even imp almost impossible to get really accurate estimation. So for, for example, in, with these uh, human face uh, data set, if you want to estimate what is a head pose, so that's the three main angles that parameterize uh, orientation of the head, uh, a human annotator won't be able to, to have a really accurate estimation of these three angles just by looking at an image. But if you generate synthetic data with a 3D simulator, you can have a really accurate estimation of your human pose. And in this way, you can train a model on this synthetic data and, and just by some transfer learning technique or domain adaptation technique, you can have a model really accurate that's going to work on the real data where it would be impossible to get uh, annotation. Another application of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, image generation methods is a uh, few shot learning. So if you have only few shots, because for some tasks, you cannot have a, a lot of data. Uh, if you are able to, to generate new data in a realistic way, it's a good way to, to train them all without suffering too much from this uh, problem of limited data. 
And finally, last, uh, let's say, machine learning application is domain adaptation. So for example, if you have a, an, a neural net that is trained to detect cars is, or to estimate depths, for example, in autonomous driving, oh, sorry, um, usually you're going to be trained in some condition. Like for example, if you have a network that is trained on day images, if you want then to test this uh, network on night images, you will see that the performance will be, will be really bad because of this domain shift. The network that has been trained on day images will perform really poorly on night images. And so if you have good, uh, let's say, image to image translation uh, models, so neural nets that are capable of translating images from day to night images, uh, you will be able to, uh, before doing the inference on your night images, you can convert, translate this night image in the day image and then run the detector in this day image. Or the other way around, what you can do is take your day uh, images from your training set, translate them in, in uh, night images, and then train a new detector that's going to work well on night images. So uh, this is just a uh, little background, the context to, to really show that when we work on uh, generating images and videos. The goal is not to have fancy images and to, you know, to have tweets and Instagram filters that are uh, super fancy. It's also that because it can be really useful for industrial application and uh, there are scientific reasons to, to be motivated in working on these problems. So now let's see some the, the basics of the problem of uh, learning to generate uh, data. So most approaches usually they, they to generate samples that follow a complicated distribution like the distribution of a uh, data set of faces. Uh, they all start from uh, distribution, from sample of a distribution we know how to generate uh, samples from. So we know really well how to generate uh, samples according to uniform regression distribution. And so the strategy consists in generating these easy samples and learning a network that will learn the mapping from this Gaussian distribution or uniform distribution to a more complicated uh, space that as is in this example faces. So the question is how to learn this uh, generator uh, network. But uh, this is the first case here what, that I show in this, uh, in this uh, graphic, it's in this image, is uh, it goes from noise to image. So we learn an unconditional distribution. We just want to learn to, uh, to obtain sample that follows the distribution of our training set. But in many applications, we are not uh, interested in unconditional distribution, but we are interested in learning to model conditional distribution. And there are many examples, like here, if you want if you have a day image, you want to convert to night image, as I was saying before. Or for example, if you want to convert a drawing to a, an RGB image, you want to condition the output image that you generate on the input edges that you draw. Or another example, if you have some uh, semantic uh, maps, like here, where each color depicts the uh, class of the object for each pixel. You want to learn the mapping from this semantic map to the output image. So today we're going to focus on this case of image to image translation, but in some cases that are a bit uh, specific. But before going to the specific problem uh, that I want to talk about today, I need to give some background about how do we do uh, this image to image translation. So the, the main paper just did uh, like a big step through, big step forward for this kind of task is this paper, Image to Image Translation with Conditional Adversarial Networks, published at CBPR in 2017. And they propose this architecture, this architecture. So let's say that we are in a, a problem where, where we want to translate a grayscale image to a color image. So we want to colorize the image. So a first approach would consist in just using a um, a simple network and with an encoder and decoder, as we call it, generator. And to train this network using just uh, 
uh, L1 distance or L2, L2 distance between the ground truth, so the colored image and the prediction. But if you use this method where you just try to match uh, the output, you will see that you, you won't get good performance. And the reason is quite, quite simple. So if you look at your data set, um, you will see that there are many colors for birds, for example. So there are yellow birds, but there are also blue birds, green birds, pink birds. And so if you want to get a network that will minimize the distance with all these possible colors, the best solution is to simply output the average of all the possible colors. So if you train network just using L1 distance, you will end up with a network that predict like grayish butterflies instead of really sharp yellow or real pink butterflies. And the idea here to avoid this problem is to have a discriminator like in a GAN framework, for those that are familiar. And this GAN framework will learn to distinguish a generated image that are the output of the generator from real images. And so in this way, if the generator output only gray butterfly, because it's the average of the distribution of the butterfly color, the, the discriminator will spot this and say, and will predict that it's a, a fake, it's a predicted color as soon as the butterfly is gray, right? So in this way, it forces the generator to somehow take some risk in predicting some plausible colors for the butterfly. So this is a, the general framework. I, I don't know if someone has question before I move to the more technical part. We yeah, sorry, I, I... I could not, I can there hear are, your question. There are questions right now. Um, my idea will be to wait until the end of the talk. So if you have okay. a question, you can write it in the chat, not the question, but your name, and then I, I can okay. ask you to formulate the question if you want. Is okay. that okay, Stefan? Yeah, yes. perfect. So uh, this, this was for the basics. So now we're going to see uh, three different application extension of this problem. Uh, the first one is post-based human image generation. So we will introduce this, uh, this specific uh, task. Then I have a, the second item I, I will uh, skip it, or I, I will mention it a bit, but really quickly, because I, I prefer to have more time to speak about the last uh, item that is a uh, video generation, and in particular, the problem of image animation. So let's start with post-based human image generation. So the problem is quite simple. Uh, the problem is the following. So we have an image of a person, and we have a target pose, and the goal is to learn to train a network in order to obtain an, an image of this same person, but in the, in the pose given by the target pose. So in this way, we are able to control the, the appearance as the pose of the person in the output image. And so the first intuitive idea would be to use the exact same pipeline that I was explaining before. So this image to image translation uh, framework and so we can apply it in a quite easy way uh, by doing as follows. So we have a the target pose that is defined just as a list of coordinates of each body pose in the image. But we, we need to convert it in a, in, a, in a tensor form in order to be compatible with uh, the input shape of the image. So the easiest way is to convert this list of 2D coordinates in heat maps, where we have a Gaussian uh, heat map around the location of each key point, one uh, channel per key point, and to concatenate this heat map with the input image containing the appearance. And you can try train this network. It will train a bit, but in practice, it won't work very well. And uh, let me explain why we have here problem that is specific to this problem that makes that this solution is not uh, not the best. So let's see a, a simple example like here, where imagine that you have this input image, 
and you want to convert this image, I mean, you want to generate a, an image of this person in input, but in this target pose. And so usually you have a network based on encoder, decoder with convolutions. And what is interesting here is that if you use convolution, you can look at the computational graph of, the, of this neural net. So in other words, we can take the take a look at these pixels in the output image, this red square. And by looking at the graph uh, implemented by this neural network, we can look at which pixels in the input image this pixels in the output image depends on. So basically, to compute these pixels, it depends only on these pixels in the previous la layer, that depends on these pixels in the previous layer, and so on and so forth, until you come back to the initial image. Right? And what is interesting here is that if you look at here, it means that the pixels on the hand will be estimated depending on the value of the pixels on the shoe, right? On the right shoe. And this is really a problem because, of course, uh, the color of the skin of the hand should not depend on the shoe, but on the pixels in the input image corresponding to the hand, right? And so this problem is coming from the nature of the network that we use, that when we have convolution, we have only a, we have only a, a dependency between neighborhood points. And so in this way, we don't depend on all the, all, all the pixels in the input image. And so what we need is what we call a deformation model. It means that we need to, to find a way uh, to, to shuttle, to send the pixels that correspond to the N in the input image to the location in the feature map that will correspond in the output with the hand. And this for everybody part. So we propose a solution for this, uh, this specific problem. And I'm going to, to explain it. So imagine that we, we have a, an image of the, the person, xA, and this person is in a pose P of xA. So this pose, again, we, we obtain it with a, a full body pose estimator. And what we want to do is to generate an image of this person, but in the pose P of xB. So we have xB here, that is a ground truth that is uh, in the available at training time, but that we would like to generate at test time, right? So what do we do? So we will uh, treat each body part independently. And so let's say, for example, that we start with this uh, right uh, upper leg uh, part. So we have the two uh, extreme points for the, for the leg part, the right, uh, right leg. And we can define a neighborhood of this leg with a rectangle of four points, P1, P3, P2, P3, P4. And we can see the location of these points in the pose P of XB, right? And so what we do as a first step is to estimate an affine transformation, FH, that will map these four points with the four point Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, okay? So what we do is just finding uh, an affine transformation that map these four points to the four points in the output pose. And once we have this uh, optimal affine transformation, um, what do we do on the features? So what do we do inside the network? So let's say that at a given layer of the neural network in the encoder side, we get some features. Let's call them F. And the first thing we need to do is to filter out also part of the features that are not related to the specific body part that we are treating. So what we do, we just apply a binary mask where we mask out all the features that are not in this rectangle that we initially considered. So in this way, we obtain this, this tensor with most of the features that, that are equal to zero and where remains only the features related to the good body part. And then what we can do is to use the affine transformation that we estimated earlier and to warp this tensor in order to obtain uh, a tensor 
corresponding to the features of the image XA, but warp to be aligned with the pose of the image we want to generate, this image XB. All right. So what we do here somehow, if we come back to the example earlier of the hand, we identify which part of the image is the hand, where is the hand in the output image. We find this affine transformation and we find a way to warp these features to the correct location for the decoder style, right? So we proceed in this way independently for each body part. And practically in our model, we consider 10 different body parts. And in the end, we need to combine all these, these features F H prime. So to do so, what we do is simply uh, element wise max polling. So we take our 10 different tensors and we just take the max for every location over the 10 different feature, feature max. So I will show, I will show later some some images to illustrate the, the better performance of this approach. But before sharing some results, I want to speak about another problem that we propose to, to tackle. Uh, this problem is uh, the problem of the use of L1 and L2 losses. So as I was saying earlier with the example of the birds, if you use just L1 or L2 loss between the, um, the predicted and the ground truth image, you will end up with blurry images like this one, because uh, as I was explaining before, for the, the colors, the same happened also for small displacement of the, of the pixels. The network doesn't want to take too much risk in, uh, in having really sharp edges, because imagine that you have your network predict the exact perfect image, but just shifted by one pixel. So for the human eye, uh, it would be almost Im imperceptible. But in terms of L1 loss, if you look around the edges, the L1 loss will be really high. So if you use L1 and two, L2 losses, you will tend to have smooth uh, images that avoid these this high L1 and uh, L2 uh, errors in the neighborhood of the edges. So the first solution could be to compute the L1 or L2 loss in a feature space, not in the pixel space. So in this way, it's quite easy. You take a network that is pre-trained, for example, uh, VTG pre-trained on ImageNet. And instead of comparing pixels, you compare the predicted image and the ground truth image in this feature space. And in this way, if you use a network that has some max polling and, and few convolutional layers, uh, you will obtain images that are more, more sharp with more contrast and better edges. This is this equation that I mentioned here. You have um, your two images. You, you fit them to a neural network that is pre-trained. And then what you do, you, uh, you just average over different possible uh, layers of your network. But still, it, we observed in our experiment that it was not sufficient to get really sharp uh, images with good uh, details. And we propose the following solution. Um, what we do is we look at all the possible small shifts. So what happens if we just shift the prediction of the image by one pixel, by two pixels in every direction? And what we do, we compare the um, the minimum of this L1 loss for all the possible location, right? So instead of just comparing just uh, the, the distance between the features for every location, for each location, we accept some neighborhood. We look in this neighborhood and we take, consider the minimum. So in this way, we are really robust to small misalignment of the prediction with the ground truth that would be almost invisible for, for human. And in this way, we force the network. I mean, we don't favor solution where the network has like a blurred images like here. So let's see some uh, some images, uh, some some results. So here in the first column, we have the input image, and this is the target pose. And so if we look at the ground truth, we have this column here. So by the way, here. Uh, 
are presented in this way, but in practice, we do the other way around, right? We have this image that is the same person as this image, and we obtain the target pose. And then if we have this target pose we, and this input image, we try to recover the ground transfer. So we have XA and this target pose, and we, we just use an image, image translation model. We obtain this image where we see that the shirt has completely lost its colors, and the colors are just inherited from the bag and maybe the background also a bit. And if we use a deformation model that will shut all the, info, the features in the, in the tensors at the right location, we see that we get much better details. Uh, in particular, the back, the backpack is, is, doesn't you know, take the whole space of the back of the person. Also, the color of the gene is much more accurate. But if we add also the, um, our nearest neighbor loss, we see that we get even sharper uh, stri uh, stri stripes on the, on the output image. Uh, and we observe the same kind of behavior on this second example, where here on the dress, um, the pattern is completely vanished out. And if we use our deformation model and our nearest neighbor loss, we see that we can obtain much better uh, details. And we perform also some experiment on this uh, higher resolution data set. So this is a deep passion data set. Again, we have the input image, target pose, and the ground truth. And we see, for example, here that without the deformation model, the, the network is not able to just copy the pattern of the, of the tongue on the t-shirt. But with our deformation model, the network is, is able like, to copy and to zoom out uh, on this pattern. Give us some other, give you some time to have a look. Then we, I mean, looking at images is good to, to get an intuition if it's working well, but uh, we also have some quantitative evaluation. So in the case of uh, image and video generation, usually um, it's a bit problematic to have uh, quantitative metrics, but it's essential for, uh, for progressing and comparing with other works. And so there they are two metrics that are uh, commonly used for this problem. So SSIM is a metric where we just look at the, how close are we from the ground truth. So it's not accurate because for example, if the background is changed, uh, this metric uh, take it in, into account what it should not. But we, and we have this metric that measure more the quality of the image but not really uh, if we are able to recognize a person with the output image. So it's good to have a trade-off, let's say, on this between these two metrics, one that evaluate if we are able to reconstruct the person correctly, and this image that say if that evaluates if this image looks realistic. And we see that we, we have, this is the best trade-off because, so, okay, we don't reconstruct as well as this network, but we get images that are much more realistic than this, this network. So what is not important here, I mean, it's not important the numbers themselves or, but, or that we are state of the art, but I, what I, I want to say here to take a message is that uh, for that kind of problem, evaluation is problematic and we, it doesn't exist a single metric that is the best. It's always a trade-off between having a good reconstruction and a good image quality. And what we need is to get a trade-off, a good trade-off between the two. Another experiment we can do to evaluate uh, our, our method is to use our method to, to, to perform data augmentation. So we did some experiments on uh, person reidentification. So the, I guess you know person reidentification. So you have a, a query image and you want, and you have also uh, a gallery with different images of different people, and you want to recover the index of the of the person in the query image. And so, what we did, we took two state of the art uh, black box methods for person identification, and we just train and test. And in this way, we get this rank one metric, rank one accuracy that is let's say similar to uh, an accuracy. 
of the hardware declaration for classification. And what is interesting is that if we take our method and we augment the data set, so it means that for every person in the training set, we generate uh, multiple poses uh, by sampling random poses. We see that, and we just then retrain the, the, this, black, this black box model without going to the details of the method. We just change the data set we use for training by doing this augmentation. We observe that we have a significant, significant boost in performance, like here where we have plus 5%. This is quite a, a lot uh, in this field. And so we, I mean, it's, it's, it shows that our network is capable of generating good image that look sufficiently realistic to be helpful to train another network. And um, also that preserve well the, the details of the patterns on the, on the cloth and, the, and the, the face to, to be helpful for uh, a discriminative model. And indeed, if we compare with other uh, methods uh, published in the literature, we see that most of them are actually harmful for the training of the ReID system. Indeed, if your images that you generate and you get you get a bigger data set, but if they are not as good as they should be, uh, then you will hurt the performance instead of getting the, the, the gain that we, we have in our case. And this is the case for all the models that we, we tried. For Augmentic, we see that we, we get the poor performance with this augmentation than when we use no augmentation. Then after observing this on, uh, on some ReID experiments, we, want, we wondered how to augment the quality of the images. And we, and we, we thought that, okay, when you just have one single image, uh, there are some body parts that you cannot see. So if you have just back image, you don't see what's, what is the pattern on the shirt, on the, with the front view. So the idea is to combine different uh, input images in order to announce the quality of the reconstruction uh, of the image in the target pose. So uh, I won't give too much detail about this, but just to give you an intuition of what we, we want to do is so we need to select in each image what is an interesting part of information that should be taken from this, uh, this image. So for this, we use an attention model that will just focus on the key element that sh should be uh, taken. And th these elements will be uh, taken based on the pose differences between the input and the output pose. So if the poses are really similar, uh, this image should be used more than the others. Uh, if there are occlusions, also some image should not be used that much, and also image quality. So if some images are, are too blurry, we should just discard them in the process. So I will skip this, but I just wanted to, to, to mention this. Uh, but I prefer to have more time to, to speak about uh, video generation. Um, so then we wanted to, to to work on video generation and to uh, more specifically to work on image animation. So what is the problem of image animation? The problem is the following. You have a, a source image and a driving video. And the goal is to generate a video with the appearance of the source image, but the motion of the driving video. So we could do it for, for full body uh, sequences like this or facial or even some uh, cartoon like here. So you have the image of the horse, but you would like to make this horse running as this, this cat. And so how to solve this problem? So the first one is, is uh, we have a really naive solution that we call appearance transfer. And actually it's just an extension of, of what I presented earlier. So imagine that you, you, uh, you take this frame, the first frame of the driving video, you estimate the key points, and then what you want to do is to use this pose to condition the generation uh, of a person of this person. So you preserve the appearance of this one, but you generate uh, an image with this target pose. And is this way you can proceed uh, sequentially on iterating all, all over the frames of the video. So this worked. 
this approach works, but it has some limitation. First, it requires a detector. So if you work on uh, human body uh, images and videos, it works. But if you work on uh, some robotic data, like here, where you have like a robotic arm grasping objects, uh, your network will, I mean, this network, this approach won't work because you will need first to annotate a key point detector uh, before uh, training your network for uh, post page generation. The same uh, problem appears here. Uh, you will need first to annotate some cartoons, many cartoons, to get a key point detector. And in addition, in this case, it would be really highly challenging because uh, you will need a, a key point detector that can handle this really large diversity of uh, appearance. Uh, so you would need really to, to get a lot of data. And there is a, a second uh, problem. It's when you have objects of different uh, sizes. But let's say that, imagine we have the same example of the cat and the horse, but now the cat is much smaller. What will happen if you just do an appearance transfer? So it means you take the pose in all these driving videos and you transfer the appearance of the source. You will end up with a, an, ani an animal that has, a, let's say, the colors of the horse but the proportion and the body overall, overall shape of the cat. But what we would like to, do, to get instead is really a video where this image is animated. We don't want to iterate, iterate from the, the proportion of this uh, cat video. So what we propose to handle these problems is a self-supervised uh, motion transfer. And I'm going to talk about this now. So the principle is, uh, is the following. We train our network in a self-supervised way. So it means that for we sample a random video in the training set. And from this random video, we sample two random frames that we refer to uh, as to source and driving frames. And the goal is to learn a motion representation, to extract a motion representation using a neural net in such a way that if we combine this motion with the appearance of the source image, we are able to reconstruct the driving frame. So this is really convenient because we don't need any supervision. We just need two frames. And from the appearance of one frame and the motion between the two, we want to be able to reconstruct the other one. And then what do we do uh, at test time? Uh, we estimate the motion between the frame zero and the frame T of the driving sequence. And we don't use, uh, but we don't compute the motion between source and driving, right? But to the generation network, we give the appearance of the source, but the motion between the frame zero and frame T of the driving sequence. In this way, the network outputs uh, a frame at time T that corresponds to the appearance of the source, but as after moving as a man in the driving sequence between frame zero and frame T. I hope that's clear. So just recap, we take, we estimate the motion between frame zero and frame T, and we want to reconstruct, we reconstruct the frame where we use the motion of the source frame, but the motion between frame zero and frame, frame T of the driving. And the key question here is what is a good motion representation? So we need a motion representation that we can transfer between this sequence and to this image. And so what we propose is to use a, a key point based representation. So basically uh, we want to encode the motion between the two frames as a displacement between uh, of, of 2D key points between the two frames. So we, have a neural network in charge of predicting key point locations. And we, so we extract key points in this way from the two images, the source and the driving frame, and we can compute key point displacement, just the difference between the, uh, the key point locations. We, and if we provide this displacement to the encoder decoder network, we are able to generate, we want to be able to generate again, the driving frame using the appearance of the source frame. And again, what is really nice here is that we don't need any supervision. 
So this key point detector is not trained on external data. It's just a minimization of this loss on the output image, this difference between the output and the driving frame that will force the network to extract meaningful key points in such a way that it's able to reconstruct correctly the driving frame. This approach works, but it, it has some limitation. And actually, um, if here we can observe that we suffer from the very same problems that I mentioned earlier, where we have the input image that is not pixel to pixel aligned with the output image. So you remember that in the post based uh, human image generation problem, we had this problem that the pixel of the hand were, were not aligned with the pixel of the, they were aligned with the pixel of the shoe and not with the pixels of the hand. Here is a, exactly the same. The pixels here are not aligned with the source. And so to correct this, we need to have a, an alignment uh, module that we introduce here. That is that we name dense motion network, and that from the key point displacement, we'll predict uh, a kind of optical flow. So it's a flow field, let's say, that is used in between the encoder and decoder in order to warp the features of the encoder to get features that are aligned with the image to be generated. So as earlier, you remember that we were mapping locations, uh, estimating affine transformation and warping the feature, feature maps. Here is the same, except it's done automatically. From this uh, key point shift, we predict an optical flow that is used to, uh, to warp the features in a good way and in such a way that we obtain features that align with that. So let me show you some results. So here we have a set, in the first row, we have some source images, and on the left, we have a driving sequence. And in this way, we are capable of getting some videos of these people moving as this um, sequence. So what is good is that we don't have any assumption about the object we can deal with. So we just need a, a large data set of the same object category and moving freely. So we can run on faces. Here we see that we can add smiles on faces. And it works also well on, on cartoons. So we are able to, to, to transfer this motion onto these images. Again, as earlier, we, it's good to look at videos to, to assess the quality, but in the end, we need to have some metrics. So uh, I, I won't spend so much time on the metrics, but basically what we measure is the capacity of the network to be able to reconstruct its input. So we are in the setting similar to the training setting. So from, oh, sorry, from the source and driving frame, we check how well we are able to reconstruct the driving frame, given that we have a bottleneck for the motion representation that has a similar, similar size. And so in this way, we're able to compare with other works and see that we outperform other methods. But the most important uh, evaluation is the user study. And by performing a user study, we could show that our method uh, is usually preferred by users. But then we, we try to improve this approach and we, have, we improved it in, in two ways. The first one is that um, we observe that there are some motions that cannot be described by just a key point displacement. So for example, if I'm moving my, my hand from left to right, this can be modeled quite well by key point displacement. But if in the meanwhile, I'm also rotating my arm this cannot be modeled by just key point shift. And so to handle this, this kind of more complex uh, displacement, we had uh, affine transformation parameters. And in this way, we, we can provide uh, what is the deformation of the features we should apply to, um, to handle that kind of uh, transformations, of non-rigid transformations. And the second contribution here is 
that we ask the dense motion network to output not only an optical flow, but an occlusion field. And this occlusion field uh, is provided to the generation network. And basically, it predicts what are the pixels in the input image. Uh, sorry, it predicts which pixel in the output image cannot be recovered by just warping the input image. I mean, for example, here in the input image, you see that this part, the left part of the image, there is a person in the foreground that occludes uh, the background. So in the output image, all these pixels on the left in the background should be inferred from the context and cannot be obtained by just warping the input image. And so this is the role of this uh, um, occlusion map is to just multiply by zero to, to cancel out the information in the tensor of the, at the output of the encoder to indicate to the network that these location in the image should not be obtained from the input image, but should just be inferred from the context in the input image. And in this way, so I, I skip a bit the mathematical details. If you want to see, a, let's say, a more formal description of the, of the method, you can refer to the, the paper. We were able to work on much higher resolution. So here we work in 256 by 256. And for example, on faces before we could handle only, you know, really constrained videos. And here we can just take a single image of, of these politicians and we can animate to get a video of them talking as uh, Barack Obama. And what is also interesting is that we can visualize the key points that we learned. And we see that overall they are really stable. If you look at, for example, the first row on the faces, there is this uh, red landmark that is constantly on the nose in between the two eyes. There is also this dark uh, blue key point that is also at the same location. So it could be also useful if, for example, you want to pre-train a key point detector and you don't want to have a, to use a lot of data, you can use our mall that, that just requires a, a data set of videos and then you can obtain this 3D with the key point detector. And yeah, let's have some comparison with other methods. So again, we have the two source images, one driving video, this is the output of our method. Same here for our Taichi data set. And if we show our previous method without the affine transformation and without the occlusion map, this is referred to as MonkeyNet. And the X2 phase, that is another older method from state of the art. We see that we get really uh, good reconstruction here. And we see also that we are capable of transferring the motion, even if you know people are in different poses or gender. Okay. Um, also, we we publish a code online, so it's uh, available on GitHub. So we have the link here. And if you don't have much time, but you still want to, you know, to play a bit with it, you can. We have a collab implementation, so I encourage you to have a look at it. So where basically you can just upload your image, upload your video on the Google Drive and see how it can, uh, uh, what kind of result you can obtain uh, with this. With, without, you know, so training any model, everything, the pre-trained model is online and you can, you just have, in a few clicks, you can train uh, that kind of video. So I'm running uh, out of time, so it's gonna be quick. Uh, then what are the, future work we have for this. So we have many possible uh, directions. The first one is to improve uh, activity recognition. So as earlier, we showed that we can improve the performance of a re-ID system by generating new images. The question is, can we improve the quality of action recognition methods by generating new videos with our setting, with our method? Uh, it could be also interesting to condition the motion on other input or the cues such as audio or text for instance 
And there are two works, uh, two future works that we already started to investigate more in particular. Uh, it's self-supervised segmentation. So how to, so we show that here we can learn key points in a self-supervised way without requiring any annotation. And so we studied how we can extend this to learn uh, image segmentation. So uh, in a, in a self-supervised way. So more specifically, we learn to segment an object in subpart, in copart. And uh, a last topic that uh, we are also working on is a uh, compression for video call. Uh, we can, uh, okay, we're gonna re go really quick on this. So the good point of our method is that if you have the first initial frame of your of the video of the stream, you want to to stand for your Zoom or Skype call. Then what you need to send in the B stream is just the location of the key point at time t. And then on the decoder side, what you do is you just take the source frame, the key point displacement between the source and the frame at time t, and you are able to reconstruct the frame at time t. So this is really good because these key points are just a few, few bits, so it's really lightweight and we can get really good uh, reconstruction. So we, uh, we have a, an archive uh, preprint online if you want to have a look at this. So that's it for my talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And also thanks a lot for all my co-authors that uh, did really amazing work. And it's also mostly thanks to their work if uh, I'm able today to present all this, this work. Uh, thanks to Alexander that was a PhD student that work on most of, uh, of this project and also Sergey that work uh, at Snapchat, Sergey and Tulyakov, and my colleagues from uh, Trento, so uh, Enver, Elisa, and uh, Miku. Thanks. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Well, thank you very much for this nice talk, this very nice talk, Stefan. I don't know if there are questions in the room. You can write your name in the chat. Okay, so we have, we have a question from Alberto, so go ahead. Hi, Stefan, uh, congrats for the talk. Uh, it's so interesting. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, based on the human pose estimation, uh, could be possible to improve the quality of some parts of the image with generative models, like for example, for small objects in hands? Uh, I'm not sure to see exactly which method you would use to enhance the quality. So you're referring to this work, right? Uh, yes, uh, generate a, a new image, but uh, improving the quality of some parts of the image. Uh, for example, uh, the quality of, of the object in hands. Like, uh, for example, if you have here a low resolution image, you would like to have an enhance. Yes, like or bl blurry image. Yeah. For example, for the video surveillance? I think it's possible. It's just a matter of training data. So if here in the input, you have a low resolution image, you, if you have a, let's say, good architecture, if you have an architecture that outputs an image with a higher resolution and that you have good training data, I think it's possible, yes. Um, for, from a concrete uh, scenario with a person, uh, could we generate a new image of the same uh, scenario with this person in a different pose, for example, to change the pose of this person. But this is uh, the, the goal of the work, right? Somehow. Yes, yes. Yeah. I Actually, see that you generate uh, an image uh, from the pose information, but uh, uh, what kind of data set uh, we need uh, to train a model? Uh, we need a data uh, for a concrete uh, scenario. Oh. So here, so we have two data set that we um, we worked on. Um, so the, the first data set, so this, these images are extracted from a ReID uh, data set. So what we need for our, our network to be trained is just a, a large collection of different people. So in this case, we have 1,500 different uh, identities. And for each identity, we need to have at least one pair in two different poses. So this this is why ReID is a good um, good way to get these data sets because you just put a camera somewhere, you record 
you know, when people are walking, you can get you know, two images of the same person in two different poses. Mm-hmm. And the second scenario, let's say application where it's possible to get data is a fashion uh, data because uh, when they or they want to sell some code, they take some they take several pictures with different viewpoints mm-hmm. and different human poses. And in this way, we can use these data. But actually, I, I think it's also related to the applications you, you want to tackle. I mean, in, in fashion industry, I, I know there are startups working on this, you know, just taking a one shot of you know just one picture and being able to visualize with different poses. So yeah. there's a data set you can get are related to the possible application you can. Of course. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I don't know if Paco has any question or. No, no, thanks. It was in the same topic that Alberto, I was sending some, some message to Alberto. It's, it's the same question because we are working with the pose, but for uh, object detection, particularly in, in particular now that the current application is weapon detection. And, uh, and we use the, the pose, you know, to detect the hand and try to to choose uh, uh, to avoid basically the, the false positive. Because in some, some cases we have false positive, but the idea is to have the matching between the, the hand, the, the box of the hand with the post and the and the box of the arms. Yeah, I see. Yeah, then for object detection, uh, I guess there are other challenges because I mean, the <coughs> difficulty of object detection, I think it will depend on the background also, for instance. So in this work as i presented here we we don't really control what is the background that we're going to get in output so for example here i mean the background that is generated is not exactly the same so i think this is something crucial if you want to do data augmentation for uh, object detection you need to to be able to control the diversity of the background you're going to generate let me another question Uh, we are working with a company that is a face recognition and uh, the one of the engineer of the company told us that now when you use the, the artificial image for face recognition, they they are not good so good now to uh, to be used in the big database in order to train the, the deep learning models. Uh, they say that that now, unfortunately, the artificial image uh, locks some kind of quality. They are not not nature in order to detect. Or to identify the, the or to be useful for yeah. training in image recognition. What in face recognition? What is your opinion about the, the future about this this model? Uh, I think is it depends on which amount of data you can have access. Because so, if you are Facebook or Google or Chinese government, it's really easy to get a lot of data. And so, if you have so much data, it will be useless to have synthetic data because you could get already as much as you want. But if you have really limited data, um, I think it's still useful to have, let's say, a a pre-training and initialization of your network with uh, synthetic data, and then to, let's say, to fine tune the model on real data. I think it really depends on the amount of data that you you have access to. Thank you. So now Oscar Cordon has a question. So uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Pablo. Well, uh, now the, the video is working. So first, uh, thanks so much, Stefan, for the nice talk. Yeah. I, I was I was uh, in doubt on asking or not because it, it was a pretty similar question to the one I was thinking to the one that has been made by Paco and, and Alberto. And I was thinking about that, but I am trying to be more specific. So the idea, I recognize it, the nice idea of using this affine transformation, this matching, in order to provide additional information to the network for your application, for this specific application you have now in the spring on the on the post-based yeah. generation. So thinking on another kind of applications of convolutional neural network, like object detection or some others, do you think that that specific methodology could be considered in order to improve the learning. So, so my view is that what you are finally giving is a kind of prior information. You have been mentioning something about the background and so on, but maybe if, if you change your mind, could that be used in order to provide additional information to the network to focus specifically 
on the futures you are interested on in order to apply it for object detection tasks, segmentation tasks, and so on. Because that was what came to my mind when, when I saw the future map you were reducing using this, this approach that seems to be very interesting. Yeah, so, so maybe my, my, my answer was not completely clear. So actually there are two ways, I would say, to use this kind of deformable approach. So first one that I had in mind in my previous answer that we can use this kind of generative method with deformation module to generate data to train a detector. Uh, and the second way is to have also um, just at the, on the detector model to have also some parts that are, let's say, more robust to deformation, right? And actually, this is something that is not new. If you think even before deep learning, we, we had these uh, part-based detector for, for pedestrians, uh, Fenton, Valve, and all these words that are, that, I mean, show an important uh, gain in performance with uh, handcrafted features. And actually also in, uh, I think there are a few works on this uh, also with deep learning where they try to, to learn the shift that you use when you apply the convolution. So you don't apply a convolution on your regular grid, but you learn how to sample uh, the point in your, in your 2D tensor to, to be more robust to, to this. So there are works on this and I'm sure it's a, a good way to, to go. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question in the room? No? Okay, so I'm going to ask something in that case. Uh, well, this is this question is very, I mean, it's really linked to the questions uh, asked by Paco and Oscar. And in this case, if, if we think about a problem like image segmentation, right? in which you have few annotated examples. Do you think the accuracy of the results obtained using image generation methods like the ones you have described today could be enough to be used to be used as ground truth for these cases in which we don't have much training data? Do you think we have arrived to that step, to that stage in which we can use the result of these generation approaches as ground truth for image segmentation? Uh, I would say not yet, because um, if you look at um, at methods generating, you know, complicated scene with a complicated structure, I think results are not really good. I mean, GAN, if you look state of the art models for GAN, I mean, they can, you can output good, you know, good images if it's just faces because you know the face is kind of constrained. It's not as complicated as a, a, a scene in the street, right? In the scene, if you just want to generate complicated scenes with you know many objects that uh, that overlap each other, nowadays we are not capable of doing it with uh, with GAN. So, I think for especially for segmentation. Uh, having a complicated scene, but with a structure that is correct, it's really important if you want to get data that are sufficiently good to be useful for the, the network that you train. So I would say our GAN methods are not ready yet to get, um, yeah, to output images that will be sufficiently good. And I think there is still a lot of work be, be, before being ready for this. And also, I'm um, not sure what would be the amount of data we would need to to train some such a network that would be capable of generating new data and so maybe the amount of data you would need to train this GAN would be already higher than the am amount of data that you need to train your segmenter network so yeah it's a bit uh a sad answer but uh, i think yeah we are okay no it's a <laughs> realistic answer i guess right Okay, so if there are no more questions, well, just the last one from myself is, um, in your opinion, related with this last answer you have given to us, what are nowadays the main challenges and limitations for image and video generation, apart from the future works you are planning to do, of course, on the field, what do you think that are the main challenges and limitations nowadays? I think the first one is the complexity of the scene. So here. Now, as I was saying, we can like 
generate really photorealistic images of faces where a human cannot distinguish if it's a real or fake image, but we are not able to generate a, you know, an image of a street with a, a crowd or many people, many cars. And this, I think we are, we are not ready yet. Another thing that I think will, um, will be uh, really interesting in the next years is um, how can we interact with the user? So here are somehow we provide a way to interact with the user, right? You can condition the output of the pose you want to, to generate uh, with your own body pose that you can record with your camera. But I think there are many interesting uh, works that could be done here is how to have the user interact on the content that the user is, is generating. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect from my side. I don't know if there are more questions because otherwise we can close the session of today. Thank you very much, Stefan. It was a pleasure to meet you and a great conference. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot. And um, by the way, so all the code of the papers I presented today are, are available. And so you can try them out. And if anyone has questions, uh, we will be happy to answer. So please. <laughs> try our, our work. I mean, we, we do some effort to have this uh, work, uh, I mean, to share and, and to have everything uh, available. So please enjoy. <laughs> okay, so we can close here much. this session. Thank you very much to Thanks. everybody, Thanks, to the speaker, for and to all the attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.